I'm delighted to be here and enjoying my every minute. We had a good visit in Akshay Patra, a fantastic experience that I had. And also yesterday, uh, all the people, some 4,500 people. It's amazing. I couldn't see the end of it. It's just <coughs> endless people out there. Uh, I'm happy that uh, you're familiar with microcredit, microfinance, as it's known today. Uh, and sometimes people wonder how this idea came about. There must be some research behind it, some lots of hard work in uh, trial and error kind of thing, or lots of thinking behind it. Actually, none of the above. It started as a kind of a accidental thing. It's a, not a pre-thought out step. And that gives also a lesson to all of us that everything doesn't have to be pre-planned. You can jump into something and make things happen. If you feel very intensively about something, you can find your way how to address that. But this was the pro problem that we had in Bangladesh at the time. This is the mid-70s. 1974, 75, 76, these are the period when we are going through famine, people dying. And that kind of gave the context, frustrations, that what kind of country that we have, what kind of nation we are, that we can't even save people from hunger. So you jump into doing things which uh, you never thought you'll do to find escape from this frustration. So this is part of that. I was teaching in the university, just like this campus, beautiful campus. But that university is located right in the middle of the villages. So it's not an urban campus. That was an advantage for me. I was just a newcomer to the campus came back from the U.S. where I was teaching to come back to Bangladesh to start my life all over again. And this is what I get. And I thought, forget about the classroom teaching, which doesn't have any meaning to anybody anyway. Why don't I just go out with the people in the village, see if there's something I can do, which I don't know anything about, but maybe as a human being, I can make myself useful to another human being. In which way, I don't know. So that was the beginning. And I did tiny little things every day to make me feel that I'm some way useful. But then I see something else coming to my notice again and again, and it's very horrifying experiences of people that I hear every day about the loan sharks, Mahajans. And you read about it, something of distance, but here is a real person right in front of you telling you the story how she has been victimized. And you don't know what to do about it. And you wonder, all this knowledge about economics and all those theories, what good it is if it is just talk about a problem like this, which is a real human tragedy. But that doesn't solve your problem, even if you feel terrible about what you have learned in school. Then an idea came, why don't I lend the money myself? If I lend the money, then people who come to me, they don't have to go to loan sharks. And the problem is solved, at least for the few people who will come to me. I thought, why not? At least I can try. So I started lending money out of my own pocket. Very small amount of money needed. One dollar, two dollar, five dollar, ten dollar, this kind of money. And people started coming to me and merrily I'm giving away my money. 
telling that you don't have to go to loan sharks. Anytime you need money, you come to me. And that encouraged people. They are coming in big numbers. And I'm excited that I'm doing something which helps people. So that was the starting point of it. And then I had a conflict with the banks because since my money was running out after several months, I thought I'll go to the bank, link the bank with the people. Sounds very good. But when I went to the bank, bank says, ah, this is crazy. Nobody will lend money to poor people. Why should a bank lend money to poor people? I said, because you're a lending organization, that's your job. They said, no, we lend money to people who have assets, who can give collateral. That's what we do. I said, I said that's very funny. You are a lending organization, but you lend money to people who already have lots of money. The real genuine thing would be you lend money to people who don't have money. They laugh at me. How innocent I am that I don't even understand these simple things. I'm sorry, I said, I don't understand your policy. It makes no sense to me. So their policy didn't make sense to me. My policy didn't make sense to them. So it's a non-starter. But I didn't give up. I kept knocking at every single door, trying to explain what I feel. Didn't work. Ultimately, I came up with another idea, offered myself as a guarantor. I said, I become the guarantor, I sign your papers, you give the money. And if they don't pay back, I pay back. Sounds good, but they, was, they were not very impressed. They thought how much money I could have that I could be a guarantor for so many people. So they had a little bit of investigation on my net worth. And they came up with the net worth of $300. That's me. So that's a professor of economics with the net worth of $300. So they said, it doesn't make sense. I said, well, let's make a beginning, put a ceiling up to which I can go, and I'll stop there. Ultimately, they agreed, putting a ceiling, and I merrily signing papers, giving money. It worked. But the banks, as it grew, banks became very reluctant. They thought this is going out of hand. They started restraining my enthusiasm for expanding it. In the meantime, I became so convinced that it works, despite all the negative things that have been told, I proved every one of them that is, they are wrong. So I was in a very inspiring mood. I wanted to continue. They wanted to discontinue. So I thought, why don't they create a bank? Completely separately for the poor people. That sounded so absurd. To anybody that I propose, I propose to the central bank, they thought it's absurd. How can you have a bank for the poor people? I talked to the finance ministry, they thought it's absurd. So that was the beginning, but again, continued to pursue this. Ultimately, in 1983, I got the permission to set up the bank. And I was kind of in euphoria that finally we made it. We created the bank in 1983, called it Grameen Bank or Village Bank, and kept on expanding. Today, after many years, 40 years, we have eight and a half million borrowers in the bank, mostly women, because we focused on women. Again, this was a, because of the debate that I had with the banks when I was fighting with them. I said, not only you're wrong because you don't lend money to poor people, you're wrong because you don't lend money to women. Not even 1% of your borrowers happen to be women. Something terribly wrong in your thinking. They tried to justify their policies. I tried to show how wrong they are. But then when I began, I want to make sure even before I started that half the borrowers in my program must be women. 
to show that it can be done. They, are said, they were telling me it cannot be done. So I wanted to show to myself that it can be done. It's easy saying, but do, it is very hard doing it. When I talk to the women, I cannot talk to her directly because in Bangladesh, at that time at least, very difficult for a man to talk to women. So I have to take my girl students with me. They will go inside, talk to the women. They come back and tell me what they're saying. And I'll give them more ideas how to tell them. So this is the conversation. I'll be standing outside someplace. But every time they refused to take money from the bank, saying that I don't know anything. I have no idea what to do with money. I never handle money. Some even said I never touched money in my life. I don't want to touch it. So that was the beginning. And I kept telling my girl students that when they say I don't know anything, I never touch money, always remember this is not her voice. This is the voice of the history which made her. History created her in a way she grew up as if she doesn't exist. She is always self-effacing. She wants to remain invisible because everybody kind of looks at her as if she is the root of all trouble. And it starts from the very birth of that person. Being a girl, she brought all the trouble in the family. So she doesn't want to raise any waves in the family by taking money or something. So she wants to stay out of this trouble. I said, our job is to go back to them again and again, peel off the fears which kind of surround them. Layer by layer, you take off the fear. So the real person ultimately can come up someday. We don't know when. It took us six years to finally reach 50-50, half the borrowers women. We were celebrating that finally we made it after six years. Then we started noticing something new, which we didn't recognize before. Money going to the family through women brought so much more benefit to the family than the same amount of money going to the family through men. It's amazing. You cannot miss it. Then we started raising questions about our own work. What is so great about 50-50? Why do we have to hide behind 50-50? Why don't you tear it apart, open it up, and focus on women? Because it's so good for the family. So we removed that. We said we can go as far as we can go. And we could have gone to 100%, but we thought we should keep some men also. So we stopped at 97%. <laughs> so today, 97% women and 3% men. People always ask, how did you design this bank? It's a very intricate system. It's not a simple system. How did you do that? Did you have to work very hard to design everything, every piece of it? I said, no, I don't do hard work. I'm an easygoing person. Then how did you do that? I think it was very simple. Every time we need a policy, need a procedure, we just look at the conventional banks, how they do it. Once we learn how they do it, we just do the opposite. And it worked. They go to the rich, we go to the poor. They go to men, we go to women. They work at the city center, we go to remote village. We have now more than 2,600 branches of Grameen Bank all over, country, all over the country. Not a single branch is located in any city, any township, any urban area. Everything is in the village. We stuck to that policy. We will work only in the village. So this is just the opposite. There are so many attractions to get to the city. I said, hold it. 
because you fall victim to the attraction, you'll have 101 reasons why you should be sitting in the city, then you'll forget what is the reason for being in this village. So conventional banks are based on collateral. We dismiss this whole idea right from the beginning. Because collateral, I keep saying, is a wall which divides the society from the banking side. So the conventional banks stay on the other side of the wall, and the rest of the people stay on the other side of the wall, which banking system never reached across the wall. I said, if we build that wall, we'll never get to the poor people. So we dismiss that. So we start doing business without any kind of collateral. Everybody said it will never work. People are smart. They'll take the money, never pay you a penny. I said, I'll try, find out. I will not take kind of wise statements like that as, as something to hide behind. I try it out and see, find out. So we found out it worked. So there is no collateral. Since we have no collateral, we don't have any legal papers between the lender and the borrower. And because of that, we don't have any lawyers in our bank. It's the only bank in the world which is totally lawyer free. <laughs> Entire banking system is based on the legal papers, lawyers pouring over every single thing, which most of the borrowers don't have time to read. So many fine prints. We dismissed all those things. It's a useless thing, dealing with poor people, having lawyers get involved. We said, forget it. Either we know how to do business without collateral or we just walk away from it. Luckily, we found a way to do that. So the whole system is built on trust. It's an amazing thing that trust works. Today, we lend out over $2 billion a year. No legal paper. My, law, my banker friends used to tell me that money that we gave out was not that big at that time. They said, Professor Yunus, can you sleep at night giving out so much money without any papers? I said, I have a very peaceful sleep. I have no problem. But I get worried about my banker friends who are losing sleep over my problem, <laughs> which I don't have. Because I know every penny comes back. I never had a, any occasion that money didn't come back. So why should I worry about something which never happened? So you go by that. Every, everything you'd see is reverse. Conventional banks are owned by rich people. If you own a bank, you must be a rich person. Very simple conclusion. But the Grameen Bank is owned by poor women because the borrowers are the owners of the bank. So that makes a big difference. Their representatives elected after three years sit in the board, make decisions of the bank. So they come from remote villages because we don't have any operation in the cities. They come from remote villages to sit in the board, make decisions about the bank. So which is again very strange. One of the largest bank in the country run by a board made up of poor women coming from the villages. And it's one of the best, probably the best bank in the country in terms of its transparency and all the things that it does. So this is how the Grameen Bank idea flourished and the idea spread around the world. Not only in Asia, it went to other countries, in Africa, Latin America, everywhere. Today, almost every single country in the world, there's a program, there's some programs which is called microfinance programs or microcredit programs. So idea is so powerful, nobody could stay away from that. But coming back, has it changed the banking system? It has not. The struggle was to change the banking system. They're saying that banking system doesn't come to the poor people. Today, still it doesn't. 
So the whole microcredit thing that we all talk about, we are familiar about, we are so excited about, is simply a footnote in the story of financial system. It's still not in the mainstream. Something wrong. They tell us, well, if you want to be a bank, why don't you become a bank? I said, well, that's a problem. Problem is, whole the banking law has been created to create a bank for the rich. It's not something you can create a bank for the poor out of that law. So you need a separate law to do that. That law was never created. So I've been appealing, I've been telling everybody that in order to make this banking real, banking for the poor real, why don't you give the license to NGOs who are doing microcredit program? Mostly NGOs do the microcredit program. Give them the license to become a bank. I'm very happy that India has taken that lead and now started giving licenses to microcredit NGOs to become microcredit banks, which opens up the door. Because as long as you're NGO, you're always looking for donor money to come so that you can lend money to somebody else, which is not a sustainable proposition. Grameen Bank, as I said, we give over $2 billion a year. All the money comes from the internal system. We don't take a penny from outside. All the money is generated inside by taking deposits. So we never had a shortage of money in Grameen Bank. We sometimes had too much money, we didn't know what to do with it. But never shortage of money. Because we take deposit. Another interesting thing, right from the beginning, we made sure every borrower has a savings account in the bank. This is part of Grameen Bank. Every borrower must have a savings account. So we have a savings account from every borrower. It starts with a penny, it starts with two penny, and then it grows. If all these eight and a half million borrowers keep savings in the bank every week, it's an it's a obligatory thing. Every week you must put something in your savings account. It grows. Outstanding loan in Grameen Bank today is a one, and, one and a quarter billion dollar, which is in the hands of the women right now. That's outstanding loan. Total savings of all the borrowers put together in the savings account is over one and a half billion dollars right now. So they have more money in their savings account today than actual loan that they have in their hand from the bank. So I tell the staff of the bank, of the officials of the bank, when they say we have so many borrowers, our borrowers did that, I said, maybe you should review that. Should you call them borrowers anymore? Because actually they are lenders. They lend money to you. Because they give more money to you than they took money from you. So the net borrower is the bank itself. That is the power. This is their own money. They don't have to do anything from outside. So we gradually added many other things like pension fund. Every woman in Grameen Bank, she builds up her own pension fund so that when she grows old, she has a monthly income coming from her own pension fund she created. It's a financial engineering that you do, out of which she has a monthly income for herself. She doesn't have to worry what happens to me when I grow old. It's a constant worry for a poor person. As long as I can work, I can feed myself. But when I cannot work, who will feed me? We said we don't have to worry. We have a financial system, institution. We take care of it. Why don't we build up our own pension fund? All the women that we have in Grameen Bank are mostly illiterate, cannot read and write. We made sure the children of Grameen families don't repeat that story. So the history of illiteracy stops with the generation of their parents. The next generation will be educated and some of them may be highly educated. What we did, we encouraged every single family to send their children to school and ensure that 100% of the children go to school. And we achieved that. Then we introduced education law. If you want to go higher education, don't worry about money. Bank will provide you all the money. Just concentrate on your education. So we have now 
graduates, we have master's degree, we have PhDs, or professionals, medical doctors, engineers, all kinds of people, all financed by Grameen Bank loan. You go to the villages, you see mother and the daughter look alike. You talk for a while, you find out mother is illiterate, daughter is a medical doctor. Why? Because Grameen Bank gave her the money, she became a doctor. And every time I see something like that, always brings me back the question, or an issue, that her mother could have been a doctor too. There's nothing wrong with her mother. Simply system never allowed her an opportunity to pursue that. So not only they look alike physically, creative power wise, intellectual power wise, there is no difference between the two. One became a doctor, another remains illiterate. Whose fault is this? Why her mother has to give up her life, sacrificing all the potential that she had for no fault of her own? And that brings me back with the, another kind of image of a bonsai tree. I keep mentioning that. I said poor people are like bonsai tree. You take the best seed of the tallest tree and put it in a flower pot and let it grow. And it grows only this height. It doesn't grow as tall as the one that you see outside. And you wonder what's wrong with that. Is there something wrong with the seed? Or did I, didn't, didn't I put enough attention to it? No, I put a lot of attention to it. Seed was the best seed, but it still it didn't grow. The simple reason is I didn't give enough soil to, for the seed to grow on. The base was very restricted base. So it became a small tree and we call it a bonsai. I said, poor people are bonsai people. There's nothing wrong with their seed as a human being. They are, potentially they are as tall, as creative as anybody else. Simply society never gave them the space to grow as tall as they could be, as sharp as they could be. So that's where the poverty issue is all about. So this is one constant issue with me that human beings, all human beings have unlimited creative power. But society put a stopper on that, kind of doesn't allow it to express itself. That's where we fail. The young people, young people come with a, and complain that they have no jobs. I tell them, well, what can I do about it? But they com completely, continuously complain about that. And I said, I wonder what happened. Why can't they get jobs? Because Bangladesh doesn't have enough jobs for so many people, so many young people. So I took a position. Next time I hear that complaint, I said, well, who told you to have a job? They can't answer that question. There's no answer to that. I said, did you read it in your textbook that you have to have a job? Did your teacher tell you that you have a job? Who told you that thing? They have no answer. Then I tell them, look, job is a very old fashioned idea. It stayed in the last century. It didn't come back here. Because we are smart people here. We've got rid of this idea of having a job. You tell yourself again and again. Almost every morning you remind yourself and tell yourself, I'm not a job seeker. I'm a job creator. <laughs> and be a job creator. Think like a job creator not like a job seeker. When you think like a job seeker, you feel small. 
you feel like you are at the mercy of other people. Don't be at the mercy of anybody. You are a human being. You, are, you can conquer the whole world. That's your job. So think like a job creator and go ahead and do it. Again, that is a speech which has no meaning for them. They even tell me, or at least they feel looking at me that I'm making a joke with them. They don't have a job and I'm asking them to create jobs. So I said, no, I mean it. We have created a social business fund. All you have to do is come up with a business idea, any business idea. And if you can present it to us and convince us it makes sense, we become your partner. We put all the money you need. So we work together. And you become successful and you buy back all the shares that I have. Because we are a social business, we are not interested in making money out of you. All we want is to get our money back. So you give the money back and you become 100% owner of your business. I take the money, invest in another young person. Now that is catching up. Hundreds and hundreds of young people come with business ideas and we become partners with them. And now they become thousands and thousands of them. So all you did is very simple ideas. Because we tell them, look, your mother joined Grameen Bank probably 20 years, 25 years back. She was shaking when she took her first loan. Probably that was about $5, $10, $20 loan she took. She's an illiterate woman. She dared to take that risk of taking that $25 and invest it and pay back the bank and then go into the next step, taking $40. If your illiterate mother can become an entrepreneur, what good is your education if you're just waiting around to find a job? You can't be as good as your mother or better than your mother with education. If you don't have any idea what to, how to start a business, why don't you go and learn from your mother? How did she come up with the idea what she did? You, have, you are a, such a lucky young person. You have in-house business consultant who has 25 years of experience. She can tell you how to run that business ins and outs. Why don't you learn from her? Make her business 10 times bigger because you are a young person with education. You know everybody. She didn't know anybody. But she did it. So why don't you start from there? So when you look at the microcredit program, Grameen program all around, you are talking about entrepreneurs. If $50, $100, $200 can turn you into entrepreneurs, what are you waiting for? Entrepreneurship is in our blood. But our education system has made sure you forget that. Absolutely, all you do Get your certificate, run for a job. So we, we, our education system has become worker producing factories. All you do is to like go out and have a job. That has to be completely redesigned. That we are human beings, we are go-getters. We get the job done. We are problem solver. We are not at the mercy of anybody. We create our own world. That should be the world. We, our job of the education institution is to discover myself. Know thyself. That used to be the motto, to know thyself. Now almost the education institutions say, know thy boss. <laughs> How humiliating that is for a human being. How small role we are assigning to ourselves by doing that. So these are the questions I keep raising and continue to do that and see how far we can go. I'll stop here so there'll be some question answer and we'll try to figure it out during that question answer. Thank you very much. Thank you.